Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Windsor. Thank you for joining me for my lecture over chapter three in the Surgical Technology for the Surgical Technologist textbook. In this lecture, we're going to be covering the first half of chapter three, which focuses on the surgical patient. After studying this chapter, you should be able to assess the different responses of the patient to illness and hospitalization, as well as demonstrate awareness that all surgical patients have the right to the highest standards and practices in asepsis, as well as distinguish and assess the physical, spiritual, and psychological needs of the patient. You should also be able to distinguish between and assess cultural and religious influences associated with the surgical patient, as well as compare and contrast the patient's responses to the process of death. And lastly, discuss the procedure for a patient death when it occurs in the operating room. So let's dive in by talking about the surgical technologist in relationship to the surgical patient. Now remember, in previous lectures, we talked about the primary roles of the surgical technologist. Remember, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a model of human de uh, development. And it was developed by Abraham Maslow in 1968, and then it was tweaked a little bit in 1971. All the requisites must be met in order to ascend to the next level. So what does that mean? It means that we start at the bottom of the model with physiological needs. Now those needs of the individual need to be met before we can move up to the next level, which in this case is safety needs. So physiological needs are things that we absolutely have to have to survive, like air and water and food. And until we have air, think about if you are trapped underwater, right? Are you gonna be worrying about building relationships with friends and your esteem needs or your love and belonging needs? Probably not. You're going to be focused on getting air because you need that air to survive, all right? So first, those physiological needs need to be met. Then we can move to the next level, which is our safety needs, our personal security, employment, access to resources, our health, our property, those kinds of things. Then once those are satisfied, it, it, uh, for example, with safety needs, if I'm worried for my life, afraid for my life, I'm not worrying about what's due at school tomorrow, okay? I'm worrying about my safety, my personal security. And until that need is met, I can't move up the hierarchy to the next level, which would be love and belonging, which is our friendships uh, and our relationships and our connections with other peoples. Above that, we have our esteem needs, which is our need for respect and recognition and freedom. And then lastly, self-actualization, which according to Maslow, we never fully reach self-actualization. There's the process of it, of be always bettering ourselves, our desire to become a better human today than yesterday and tomorrow than today. And an example of that is all of you enrolling in a surgical technology program is a step along your path to self-actualization. So let me ask you a question. Which of these levels do you think is our main focus in surgery? If you said physiological needs, you would be right. These are the needs we focus on providing to our patient first and foremost. Then safety, love and belonging. 
So each culture, and we've talked about culture before, expresses different values. And it's important that we, as surgical technologists, are aware of these fundamental values and beliefs. Now, while Maslow's hierarchy of needs focused on the needs of the patient, cultural values specify the way the patient thinks and feels. It's important to understand that cultural values can conflict with modern medicine. And as surgical technologists, we need to establish a basic understanding of faith traditions and how they relate to various aspects of surgical care. For example, American Indians discourage organ donations. Also, Jehovah's Witness discourage blood transfusions. So these faith traditions can have a significant impact on the care that we provide or don't provide in the operating room. Please be sure that you are familiar with the various religions and religious values covered in Table 3-1 in your textbook. Surgical intervention. It's not just a physical event for our patient. It's also a psychological, social, and spiritual event. I can use myself as an example. When I was in my 30s, I needed to have my hip replaced, and I was worried about how intense the rehabilitation would be. How long would I be out of work? What if something went wrong during the surgery and I couldn't work anymore? How would I support myself and would this impact my role as a, a future wife or mom or stepmom? I wondered why it was happening to me, right? I had a little struggle with my faith and um, I even asked my pastor to come and pray over me uh, to have a successful surgery and speedy recovery. It's important to remember that our patients are human beings, and it might be silly to say this, but fast forward 10 years into your practice as a surgical tech, sometimes we can lose sight of this when our patients are all covered up with drapes, and maybe all we see is their ear that we're working on, right? They can be reduced to the tympanoplasty in room five or the hysterectomy in room two and so on and so forth. So we always wanna remember that our patients have a life outside of the operating room, that their moms, dads, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, etc., and they're also scared, right? We participate in surgery day in and day out, but they don't. Surgery becomes normal to us, but it is anything but normal for our patients. And even for myself, when I had my hip surgery, I had been uh, a surgical tech for 10 years at that point. And it was still very scary being a patient and having surgery. So let's talk about some causes of surgical intervention. Some of those include genetic malformations like cleft lip or cleft palate, trauma such as broken bones, ruptured spleen, or some sort of torn ligament, neoplasms which are uh, a type of cancer or abnormal growth in the body, could be various diseases like cholecystitis which is an inflamed gallbladder or tonsillitis, inflamed tonsils. The patient could have some sort of condition like a kidney stone or a psychological state where they feel that to be accepted, they need a facelift or a nose job or a breast augmentation or maybe even a tummy tuck. But remember, we should not define patients by their surgeries, diseases, conditions, or malformations. To do that is to dehumanize our patients, and we don't want to do that. So every patient responds to illness, hospitalization, and surgery in their own unique way. As surgical techs, 
we need to be aware of and sensitive to our patient's feelings. I have heard and seen patients express their feelings in a lot of different ways, from laughing and cracking jokes to crying or even screaming or swearing. Some of them wake up swinging. Some bring religious artifacts into the operating room with them, like crosses or rosary beads. Others have a stuffed animal with them. Some want a hand to hold, and others are literally shivering in fear. However they express themselves, we want to make sure that we approach them with kindness and caring at all times. Now, research has shown that an individual's ability to adapt and manage stress, and surgery is a stressful time, uh, are significant factors in how they react to uh, their health, illness, uh, and or hospitalization. And according to Sister Callista Roy, who you see on the screen now, and her Roy adaptation model, the patient is a biopsychosocial creature. So this means that all of us are products of our biology, which is our genetics, right? Our mind or our mental status and the environment that surrounds us. And as a result, patients have varied abilities to adapt to and counter stressors associated with illness or trauma. Some may adapt really quickly while others do so more slowly And that's based on a variety of things like the nature or type of the illness or trauma, their their availability to family support, their cultural values and beliefs, their level of social development and intelligence, their personality, and their learned responses. Now, Dr. Hans Seya is an expert in the area of stress, and he defines stress as a non-specific response of the body to a demand. And there are two types of stress, distress and eustress. So when we say that uh, we are stressed or we're stressed out, we're usually referring to distress, which is the negative type of stress. You stress, on the other hand, refers to a positive or desirable type of stress. Did you know there could be good stress? Uh, the prefix EU literally means well or good. So an example of you stress could be preparing for the arrival of a new baby or planning a wedding. Uh, it could also be Mm, the stress associated with starting a new job or even getting a promotion. All of those are good things, all good things, all good things, but they can still bring a certain level of stress into our lives. So stress, suffice it to say, is both psychological, what goes on in our mind, our mental status, and physiological, what goes on in our bodies. And a lot of times we refer to this as fight or flight. And fight or flight is initiated by a certain part of our nervous system. And it gets our bodies ready to react to a threat or a harm, uh, some sort of harm. And because of this, uh, people vary in their reactions to stress. Stress can present in a variety of ways to include loss of of appetite, weight loss, change in body functions like digestion or fluid and electrolyte balance, changes in our mental status, increased blood pressure and heart rate, and changes in metabolism. I can remember the first time that I was asked to speak about surgical technology at a high school to a large group of students. And I remember feeling really excited, but I was nervous at the same time. And while I was waiting for my turn to present, I got this notification from my watch that felt this little vibration. And and when I looked at it, it said, are you working out? Uh, It detected that my heart rate was 120 beats per minute, which 
is a little bit above the normal rate of 80 to 100 for an adult. So um, I think it's important to recognize that while this chapter focuses on the surgical patient, that we're not immune to stress. And even if you love being a surgical tech more than anything else in the entire world, like me, it's still going to be stressful. Remember to care for your own mental and physical well-being. And there are a variety of ways that we can do this. Some of the ways are through meditation or mindful breathing, movement and exercise, creative expressions like music, art, drawing, writing, uh, also included could be crying, laughing, and also surrounding yourself with people that are supportive and loving and cultivating healthy relationships. So let's talk about some factors that we need to be aware of when it comes to our patient's mental and physical status. First of all, the type, nature, and severity of the illness, trauma, or disease. In addition to that, we need to consider the patient's previous experiences to illness, trauma, disease, and even surgery. This can even extend to friends and family members' experiences. The, I knew someone who knew someone who had this happen kind of thing. Like, for example, maybe a patient says, my, my friend had his gallbladder removed and they left a sponge inside of him. Or... I remember when Michael Jackson died and propofol was all over the news and patients would come in and say, I don't want propofol, I don't want propofol. Propofol is a very common drug that anesthesia care providers give during uh, induction or when they're, they're starting to put the patient to sleep. So, um, you know, it, patients were very afraid of that because they were hearing those stories on the news. Something else that can factor in is the patient's age. Now, while, uh, and we'll talk about specialty populations later on, but pediatric patients can feel threatened or they can have separation anxiety when they are removed from their caregiver. It's also important to consider that adolescents are a lot more conscious about their bodies and their body images Older adults are going to have a myriad of concerns about their current health, future health, status of their family, their job, how they're going to pay bills, so on and so forth. Also, the environment of the operating room or the health care facility in general is very strange. The operating room is very cold. The patient is going to be surrounded by a bunch of people that they don't know. They can't see their faces, only just their little eyeballs. And so that can be very unnerving. Also, we've asked the patient not to eat since midnight or drink the night since midnight the night before. So if they're having surgery at 2 p.m. the next day, that's a really long time to go without food. So they're going to be hungry. They're going to be thirsty. They're on a different schedule. Maybe they had to get up super early to get there to have surgery, or they've been in the hospital and they're woken up every two hours to um, get some sort of testing or something like that done, blood draw, vitals, those kinds of things. Um, the family role, if the patient's a sole provider or they're a contributor to the household, they are going to be concerned about how they're going to continue to provide for their family. Economic factors such as how they're going to pay the bills, how they're going to pay their health care costs, and if their job is still going to be there are going to be concerns as well. And then lastly, but not least, religious beliefs can definitely affect the views and attitudes of our patients. They uh, might refuse blood transfusions while others request to take home the placenta after giving birth. So these are some factors governing patient responses to illness and hospitalization. Next, we're going to talk about coping mechanisms. 
we're going to wrap up the first half of this lecture on chapter three by discussing coping mechanisms. So there are four coping mechanisms that patients may exhibit when faced with stressors, and those are denial, rationalization, regression, and repression. Now denial the patient does not want to accept the truth of what is happening. The second coping mechanism is rationalization. And the patient is going to rationalize away their illness or disease, just like this kid is rationalizing failing his test because his teacher doesn't like him. So let's say we have a patient that has diabetes and they're needing their foot amputated because of the progression of the disease. They might say, diabetes runs on my father's side of the family. Like, you know, rationalizing the reason why their diabetes has progressed, their disease has progressed. The next coping mechanism I want to talk about is regression. And regression is when the patient returns to an earlier stage of life and exhibits those behaviors. So typically, regression is back to a childlike state. So you might see the patient in the fetal position, they might be crying. Maybe they're talking like a baby, like childlike talk or words. They might even be pouting. And lastly is repression. With repression, the patient represses their thoughts and feelings about their illness, disease, condition, trauma. They will avoid discussions concerning what is happening, which is similar to escaping or avoiding the situation. All right, so that concludes part one of the lecture on chapter three. I hope it was insightful. Maybe you got a little chuckle out of it. Uh, either way, thank you so much for listening.